Good evening. <laughs> I am David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to the William G. McGowan Theater here at the National Archives, whether you're joining us in person or through our YouTube channel. I'm pleased that you could be with us for tonight's discussion, the Emancipation Proclamation, Origins, Impact, and Legacy. This program is made possible in part by the National Archives Foundation through the generous support of United Airlines, and we thank them for their support. Before we get started, I'd like to tell you about two other programs coming up in the next week. For many years, the National Archives has participated in the Environmental Film Festival in the nation's capital. This coming Thursday, March 22nd at 7 p.m., we continue that partnership with a screening of Generation on the Wind, a 1975 documentary film that profiles a, a group of young artists, mechanics, and environmental activists who successfully built the largest electrical generating windmill in the world. And next Tuesday, March 27th at noon, author Elaine Weiss will be here to talk about her new book, The Woman's Hour, The Great Fight to Win the Vote, which is about the ratification of the constitutional amendment that granted women the right to vote, and which is the subject of our next, next major blockbuster exhibit opening in March 2019. To learn more about these and all of our public programs and exhibits, consult our monthly calendar of events at archives.gov. Check out our website to sign up, and there's a sign-up table outside the theater where you can get email updates. And you'll also find information about other National Archives activities and programs. Another way to get more involved with the National Archives is to become a member of the National Archives Foundation. The Foundation supports all of our education and outreach activity, and there are applications for membership in the lobby or you can become a member at archivesfoundation.org. And a little known secret, which I keep telling everyone who will listen, no one has ever been turned down for membership in the National Archives Foundation. <laughs> On the occasion of the 130th anniversary of the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation, renowned historian John Hope Franklin spoke here at the National Archives. He described the scene in Washington, D.C. on January 1st 1863, as President Abraham Lincoln signed the document, and hours later, as, as the news of the proclamation spread through the city. Far into the night, there was, as Professor Franklin described, unrestrained celebration characterized by men squealing, women fainting, dogs barking, and whites and blacks shaking hands. From that first celebration to the present day, the Emancipation Proclamation has re been regarded as one of the most important documents of American history. Shortly after the National Archives building opened, the proclamation was displayed in the rotunda in 1937. Uh, actually, that was about eight years before the uh, actual charters arrived here from the Library of Congress. This past February, we displayed the document again, although its fragility means that we must limit public display to only a few days. Whenever we have brought it out the public, for the public, whether here or at museums across the country, people line up to see it. The proclamation represents a promise of freedom and justice that continues to resonate with people more than 150 years after its creation. Tonight, we come together to examine the Emancipation Proclamation's origins, origins, impact, and legacy, and I'd like to welcome Governor James Blanchard to the stage to get us started. Governor Blanchard is the chairman of the National Archives Foundation's Board of Directors, he previously served as the United States Ambassador to Canada from 1993 to 1996, the 45th Governor of Michigan from 1983 to 1991, and as a member of the House of Representatives from Michigan's 18th District from 1975 to 1983. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Governor Jim Blanchard. Thank you, Mr. Archivist. And by the way, being chair of the Archives Foundation Board is the most fun assignment I've ever had. <laughs> like a lot of you, I love history. And we have as the archivist a world-renowned archivist. As a matter of fact, a couple of years ago, he made sure that all of us on the board could go over and help celebrate with the Queen of England the 800th anniversary of the Magna Carta. So that was really exciting. 
There are some other Archives Foundation board members here. I'd like them to raise their hands because without them, we wouldn't be able to operate. And a special welcome to Congressman Jim Clyburn because without the members of Congress, originally the Archives wouldn't exist, although it was proposed by Franklin Roosevelt. We still needed congressional support, and we do to this very day. By the way, my predecessor is going to be part of the panel. You're going to have an exciting panel here, Alilia Bundles. So I wanted to make a special shout out to her because she made it possible for me to become chair of the Archives Foundation. So, you know, loyalty in, in this business is all important, especially <laughs> sincere loyalty, intelligent loyalty. Uh, would go a long way in this town, wouldn't it, ladies and gentlemen? Um, no, this is the 155th anniversary of the Magna Carta, or, excuse me, the, Emancipa Pro the Emancipation Proclamation. The only thing I'm going to say is the historian James McPherson, who has been honored by our foundation over the years, has said, and I quote, the Emancipation Proclamation is one of the great iconic documents of American history, right up there with the Declaration of Independence. Now, our foundation board here works with the archivist, with the very fine archive staff to help promote and support uh, and help finance different exhibitions here that are important to our citizens in this town, but all around the country. And we're proud to do that. And we are really excited with the sponsorship tonight of this event by United Airlines. I'm good. You, could, you can applaud one more time here. I, I have the privilege of introducing one of the leaders of the United Airlines who divides her time between Chicago and Houston. She is Vice President of Community Affairs of the United Airlines, and that she deals with the strategy of enga engaging all the communities that United is, is involved with. Uh, she's been recently, she was Vice President of Customer Contact. That's a tough one in this today's, today's world. She led a global team of 5,000 people in 13 centers in nine countries and uh, presided over really the business in 35 states. But what's interesting is in addition to like community relations and government relations and employee relations and customer relations, she's actually an accountant and an auditor. And I said earlier, I, was, I looked at all these awards she's received for community affairs, engagement, citizenship, leadership, the one I like was the Chicago, let's see what it was. It was the Institution of Internal Auditors. They gave an award in 2013, the Institution, Institute of Auditors for Inspirational Woman of the Year. I said earlier, I can't imagine how someone could become the inspirational leader of a bunch of auditors. <laughs> but but Sharon, Sharon Grant did that. And that tells me she's got to be good. I give you Sharon Grant. Thank you again. Good evening. It is a pleasure to be with you this evening. Um, a pleasure 155 years in the making. I stand here this evening before you, and I don't take this lightly. Um, on behalf of United, we're deeply honored to be sponsoring the viewing and this dialogue that we're going to have um, because we recognize, and I recognize, the gravity, the intensity, and really the utmost respect for what the Emancipation Proclamation has done for our country. And as we continue forth 155 years later to advance our country and the world of all that it means, it is a pleasure to see each of you come out this evening to be a part of that conversation. So I want to thank you for joining us to hear our distinguished panel guest about all the Emancipation Proclamation means, its history, and the defining moments of where we will go forward. United Airlines is extremely proud to sponsor cultural institutions like this, the National Archives, that foster cultural awareness 
and move to inspire diverse communities that we serve for you and all the public. So recognizing this anniversary this evening, it is core to us and our core values of connecting people, uniting the world, breaking down barriers, and inspiring a future generation. So I thank you for coming out this evening and enjoying the panel, but more importantly, to participate in the dialogue. So have a good evening. Thank you. It's now my pleasure to welcome our panel to the stage. Our moderator this evening is David Blight, professor of American history at Yale University, and also the director of the Gilder Lehrman Center for the Study of Slavery, Resistance, and Abolition at Yale. Joining him tonight is Congressman James Clyburn, United States Senate uh, Representative for the 6th District of South Carolina. Alelia Bundles, um, who probably needs no introduction to this audience. Alelia is the previous um, chair of the National Archives Foundation, who is um, busily writing, finishing up a book about her great-grandmother, um, Madam Walker. When will we see it? Tomorrow. OK, good. <laughs> It'll be in your bookstore soon. And Edna Green Medford, professor and former chair of the Department of History at Howard University. Please join me in welcoming our panel to the stage. Well, thank you, and uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you, David. Um, thank you, United Airlines. Thank you, Governor Blanchard. I grew up in Michigan, <laughs> in Flint. <laughs> oh, really? But I think I left before you were governor, so I never got a chance to vote for you. Sorry about that. Um, but let's talk about Flint later. <laughs> anyway, um, we're here, obviously, to talk about that document, the Emancipation Proclamation. It's drafting, it's origins, it's meaning, where does it come from, but also it's legacies. What has it meant over time? What does it mean now? You've all either participated in or heard the stories of when this document is brought out, whether here in Washington at, in this temple of treasures or out across the country, it, lines form. Why does that happen? Why does that happen with this document? What makes it sacred? What are we seeking when we need to see an original document, even if we can only barely actually read the words? Just a half hour ago, when I, I leaned over it, and by God, I could make out thenceforward and forever free. I could make out military necessity. The favorite phrases or important phrases. But, why do we do this? I, there are lots of answers, and we're going to perhaps discuss some of them. Is, is it because sometimes, this is fun to ask all these rhetorical questions, by the way, because I don't have to answer them. <laughs> they do. But is it because sometimes our present can be so unstable, the future seems so unsteady, that a <clears throat> sacred document, when you see it and you're in the presence of it, gives us something like uh, grounding, confidence, uh, knowledge of a past, knowledge of great change in the past represented by a document. Um, there are lots of answers to that. I want to place you, though, just in a moment. Um, after this was finally real, after the preliminary proclamation of September of 1862, which was Lincoln's warning, there are many other ways to characterize it, but it was Lincoln's warning to the South that if they did not lay down their arms, 100 days later on January 1st, all the slaves in the states in rebellion would be thenceforward and forever free. That language of thenceforward and forever free is in the preliminary proclamation. And then comes the final proclamation, so anticipated, so much waited for, 
even with great anxiety in black communities, would he sign it? Would there be some new compromise overnight? What did it mean? But once it was signed, Frederick Douglass, the greatest voice of African Americans in that era, took a speech on the road in late January and February, as Douglass always did, all over the North. It was called the Proclamation and the Negro Army. And among the many things he says in that speech, which is in part a recruiting speech, was this simple line. He said, quote, we are all liberated by this proclamation. Everybody is liberated. The white man is liberated. The black man is liberated. The brave men now fighting the battles of their country against rebels and traitors are now liberated. It was Douglas, as usual, being Douglas, trying to capture in a sentence or two the meaning of a huge historical moment. Now, I want to start with Edna, since she and I are the practicing <laughs> historians here, <laughs> to, to lay out a little bit uh, of how do we get from Port Sumter, the outbreak of this war, to January 1, 1863, a war that in the first year and a half of the conflict, almost two years, was a war to preserve the Union on the northern side and a war for southern independence on the southern side. And there's a tremendous amount of controversy, confusion, and conflict in this first year and a half of the war over just how, if or ever, this would become a war against slavery. But how do we get from Fort Sumter, to this document, frankly, so fast and under such extraordinary and violent circumstances. How do, how do we get there? That's a tough thing to handle yeah, as much, a historian. How much time do we have? <laughs> okay. But uh, well, I, go for I, it. I, if, if I may, I'd like to start before Fort Fine. Sumter. Fine. Okay. Because Lincoln comes into office indicating to the seceded states that he has no intention to interfere with their domestic institutions, specifically slavery, because in their ordinances of secession, most of them had talked about the fact that this new Republican coming into office was going to deprive them of this particular institution. Mm -hmm. So he's got to assure them that that's not going to happen. They don't believe him, and darned if he doesn't touch the institution eventually, but a lot goes on before he gets to that point. Right. The South, uh, the, the Confederates, from the very beginning, are using enslaved people for their cause. Right. And so they're having, they're impressing uh, enslaved people when they have to. They are hiring them from slaveholders when right. they can as well. And so Lincoln, very early on, realizes that this is an advantage for the Confederacy mm -hmm. and that it's going to be harder to win this war if he cannot separate this labor force from the Confederacy. And so he's attempting to get the border states that have not seceded to decide that they're never going to join the Confederacy. They're going to free their enslaved laborers, and the Confederacy will realize that it will not get any larger. But of course, the border states are not interested in doing that. They Congress, all turn into they, Absolutely. Congress does some things along the way. They do have the first Confiscation Act uh, and the second Confiscation Act, but both of those things are rather unwieldy, at least the second one is. There has to be a court uh, order and all of that, and it's, it's about uh, separating the rebels from right. their, their property and so forth. So Lincoln had hesitated initially because he felt that he, was, he did not have the authority to do anything about slavery in those places where it already existed. And so by, by the summer of, 80, of 62, however, he's decided that there is something he can do, and he can use his war powers. Mm -hmm. The fact that the commander-in-chief has the authority through the Constitution to uh, do whatever is necessary to quell a rebellion. So he uses that clause in the Constitution. Uh, but he does give them a warning. He gives them a 100-day warning. So that's September 22, 1862, uh, proclamation, preliminary proclamation, is a warning. And he says, if you come back into the Union by January 1st, nothing will happen to your enslaved laborers. But of course, no one thought that they really were going to give up. 
and so on this January 1st. This is which the Confederacy is winning the war. Absolutely <laughs> they are. And so, and, and so you, ha you need these enslaved laborers separated from the Confederacy because the Union needs them as, as uh, military men. That's great. That's, that's like a short column in a textbook, and you nailed it. <laughs> uh, I, I might only just add there for the scale of it that to some degree, we get an Emancipation Proclamation because of the sheer scale of the war. Yeah. Yeah. To defeat the Confederacy now by the spring and summer of 1862, mm -hmm. it's pretty clear. You're going to have to destroy slavery. Yeah. You're going to have to destroy its social institutions. And when he does issue this proclamation, or the preliminary proclamation even, the attacks on it, even when the North were, oh, you're going to launch a social revolution. Mm -hmm. Well, that's right. That's true. That's true. That's what's going to happen. This war, the scale of this war has become so big, so totalizing, that it's going to have to be a war on a society. Right. Now the question became, how do you legally do that? How do you do it militarily? And... <laughs> as you know, as we all here know, the problem with this document has always been we want it to be a beautiful and richly moral document. Its meaning is moral. I mean, God knows, that's why people line up. Its, its long-term meaning is deeply moral. But its actual language is like a legal brief. It's a boring legal brief. It's Lincoln trying to craft something that's within the kind of tortured definition of the war powers. As military commander in chief, he has the power to do, to confiscate property of the enemy. <clears throat> and there again, I mean, it, it leads us into realms of history that we don't always like to think about because they're sort of counterfactual, but without the war, no emancipation. And God only knows when in the 19th century or the 20th this would have ended in the United States. So he has to do an executive order. Could, could, could you say just a bit more on that before we get into the legacies of this and all? I mean, the actual document, the actual language of this proclamation provided for what and where? Because mm -hmm. that's important. Sure, absolutely. And that's where it got a lot of criticism. Oh. Because what the document does, it, it indicates that those enslaved people who are in states or parts thereof still in rebellion will be freed. Right. But he says nothing about those Union slaveholding states, right. you know, Maryland, Delaware, Missouri, Kentucky. Right. Uh, and he doesn't say anything about those because he can't do anything about those legally from a constitutional perspective. And so Unless he wanted to be an even more radical. Exactly. And he really would have had, had he wasn't. Roddy down in his head. Exactly. He was a moderate. Right. Absolutely. And so you've got that one thing there. Uh, he, what, to me, the second most important thing in the document is the clause that says that black men are to be right. brought into military service. It's right there toward the it's, end of it. Absolutely, and it is so important because right. black men had been attempting to get into the war from the very beginning, right. and Lincoln didn't want it, Congress didn't want it, most white Americans did not want this to be a war about the freedom of black people. They kept saying, this is a white man's war. Yeah. We don't want this assistance of black people. Right. But Lincoln understood early on, I mean, not just January 1st, 1863, right. but certainly right. by the end of the first year, that he would need the assistance of black men to win the war. It really is. I mean, it's, it's the authorization. It, virtually, he's ordering the American military to recruit black troops. Now, that process, Absolutely. too, is going to be brutally discriminatory yeah. and ugly and bloody. But the document all but orders the United States military to recruit black soldiers. Mm -hmm. That's your social revolution <coughs> beyond just what's happening on the ground. Black soldiers in Union Blue. Right. Now, how, exactly how that's going to be done, the document doesn't say, and I'm not sure Lincoln had thought that through very much. But it, that before we get to the legacies, it, as Edna just implied, if Lincoln... Lincoln's preferred way of doing emancipation in this war would have been 
gradual emancipation enacted by the states themselves. That's what he was trying to do. Get them to do it themselves. And then compensated. They would be compensated so much money per slave. And then with, to some degree anyway, the colonization of black folk voluntarily outside the United States. Gradual, compensated, and colonized emancipation. Now that's not to denigrate Abraham Lincoln. That's where he started. That's not where he ends up, right. which is part of the great story here. That's not where he ends up. And the war didn't let him end up there. History didn't let him end up there. It's also worth thinking about, at least, is it not? We historians are always trying to quell the, the urge for believing in inevitability. You know, the war was inevitable, the land of slavery was inevitable, the Emancipation Proclamation must be inevitable. We're America, it must have been enough inevitable. Uh, it's like that old line, we're America, we don't torture. <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> anyway, um, there's nothing inevitable about this proclamation. Absolutely. It comes out of events mm -hmm. and decisions mm -hmm. and a horrible war. So it didn't just you know, come down from on high. Absolutely. Alelia and Congressman Clyburn, it's an honor to be on this panel with both of you. I'd like to hear both of you reflect, at least to begin with, on growing up. What did you know about the Emancipation Proclamation? What did you learn about it? How did you learn about it? What did it mean? Um, when did you learn about this document and the events surrounding it. Lee, you want to go first? Yeah, because I don't want to follow the congressman well. on, this. <laughs> on this question. Because he grew up in South Carolina, and South Carolina is so pivotal for all of this. But you know, I was I learned about the Civil War and Reconstruction. Right. So you know, so blended Good. into Together. that is the emancipation. Because my grandfather, don't. who was born in 1892, had a <clears throat> grandfather who had been freed as a child in Tennessee, lived in Ohio, moved to Memphis, <coughs> and ended up in Arkansas during Reconstruction, mm -hmm. and was elected to the state legislature in Arkansas, and was elected superintendent of prisons in Helena, Arkansas, and Phillips County, which was a very notorious county. But my grandfather is really the one who told me about Reconstruction and what it meant for that first generation of formerly enslaved people to be free, to be involved in politics. So I had a very different lesson from my grandfather than I had in my history books, which basically mentioned black people one time um, when I was in high school in the 1960s and said enslaved people were happy. So this was a really different lesson that there had been this real opportunity during Reconstruction for political power. So you, you grew up learning about black reconstruction politicians, mm -hmm. and this exercise of freedom, an exercise of the right to vote from within your own family. Right. And hence, emancipation was the source of that story. The source of that story, absolutely. It was not the birth of a nation in South Carolina. It was not that version of the story. Uh -huh. <laughs> I hope not. Yeah. Congressman. Well, um, I, is, I can't remember. Mm -hmm. when the, in the one lesson. Yeah. Uh, when I was growing up, uh, the biggest celebration in the black community was Emancipation Day. Mm -hmm. uh, there were parades. Mm -hmm. There were just big celebrations on January 1 every year. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I just knew about it. I mean, there was no one incident that um, mm -hmm. made me open up a book and said, I want to learn about the Emancipation Proclamation. It was just there, you knew. I grew up in a uh, very political household. Hmm. My parents were Republicans. They were members of the party of Lincoln. Sure. Um, now, I've always sort of been curious about not just what happened, but why things hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. And so, if, as a pre-teenager, uh, I, um, I, I just started diving into why things happen. So, 
I'm having a little bit of a problem uh, here t tonight because Lincoln served one term in the United States Congress. What, 1848? Mm -hmm. I think it's when he got elected. During the Mexican War. Yeah. But during that one term, he introduced legislation, anti-slavery legislation in 1848. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I just always felt that the Lincoln-Douglas debates, the birth of the Republican Party, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's all about anti-slavery. Mm -hmm. So I'm just having a real problem believing the only thing that motivated him was to win the war. That's not the only thing that motivated him. Okay. <laughs> uh, I just... I just well, uh, 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 are we are we ruining something about Lincoln for you? <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> That's what you get when you put historians on panels. <laughs> I mean, I mean yeah, I, I'm for all of this. I mean, I may factor that into some of my future thinking, but um, right now I'm holding on to the fact. You know, I, I'm one of these people. I know my favorite president uh, is Harry Truman. Huh. Now. Why? When I was, well, Harry Truman, I guess it's all summed up in a little story I read. But there's a little book that I'm sure you've read it called The Wit and Wisdom of Harry Truman. Uh, I, my Bible, my political Bible, is McCullough's. Oh, the biography. Of Truman, yeah. the biography of, of Truman. And um, in this little Wit and Wisdom book, a reporter one day asked Strom Thurmond. Some of you may have heard of uh. Strom Thurmond, uh, the senator from South Carolina, who famously said in the public speech that our Negroes are happy uh -huh. Uh -huh. with their plight. Uh -huh. um, a reporter asked uh, Thurmond, why did he hate Truman so? Mm. Because you were very supportive of Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. And Truman is not saying or doing anything more than what Roosevelt did. Uh, Thurman replied, yes, that's true. But Truman means it. Uh. <laughs> now, and if you look at, huh. you know, Emancipation Proclamation is, in fact, an, or was an executive order. Yeah. yeah. That's what it was. The armed services were integrated in 1948 by Harry Truman by executive order. Right. Congress was not going to do it. Right. I think Lincoln demonstrated in 1948 uh, that Congress was not going to do anything about slavery. Yeah. Yeah. So it seems to me that the mere fact that he used the war powers to do the Emancipation uh, Proclamation um, said to me that um, there was something within him mm -hmm. uh, as a person uh, that made him loathe slavery. That's just where I am about that. Well, are you... May I just... Sure. <laughs> Please. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> we, we're not saying that there were not other factors. It's certainly Lincoln understood that this was a moral issue. He said it often, that mm -hmm. slavery was a moral issue. And if you look at the end of the Emancipation Proclamation, he talks about this being an act of justice, and he invokes God's name, you know, God's, God's uh, blessings, for the most part, you know, on what he's about to do. So he certainly understood that. But he was also a man who was very much wedded to the Constitution. And he didn't want to step beyond his authority in that regard. And so when Congress would not step up and do it, he had no other choice but to do it himself. But had the war not occurred, he would have been willing to let slavery die a natural death because he believed that the Founding Fathers had put slavery on the path of extinction by, you know, with the Northwest Ordinance and all of that, you know, they, they, they were trying to contain slavery from the very beginning. And so he realized, he felt at least, 
that if the country waited long enough, if slavery could be contained, it would eventually die a natural death. So he wasn't, but he wasn't an abolitionist, not until the war occurred. He was anti-slavery. He, he was against the extension of slavery, but not, not, he was not willing to destroy slavery outright immediately. He was very much a gradualist. Well, I seem to, to uh, uh, feel, I've always felt that Frederick Douglass's arguments uh, on behalf of blacks fighting in the war, fighting for their own freedom, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, had some influence on, uh, on Lincoln in, because I, he certainly mm -hmm. didn't ha have to put that phrase into the Emancipation Proclamation for it to be effective. I mean, it was almost gratuitous to me to put the language in there mm -hmm. about fighting the war, unless, as you say, the numbers were of such uh, mm -hmm. that he needed mm -hmm. them in order to win the war. Yeah. I don't, you know, that may be, and I'm perfectly willing to accept that, but um, I, um, I've always felt that uh, that meeting that uh, was the 1862 meeting, I forgot what month it had to be before September, uh, because Robert Smalls yeah. was in that meeting with Lincoln and Frederick Douglass. And Smalls, if you know, did not gain his freedom, I believe it was May of 1862, yeah. March maybe, or May. Stole his own freedom. Right. And so he comes to Washington, uh -huh. and he hooks up with Frederick Douglass and goes to this meeting with Lincoln to argue on behalf of black people fighting in the war. Yeah. So the question is, could this have happened without the Emancipation Proclamation? Yeah. Could they have enlisted black folks? In? Well, probably could have. Um, Robert Smalls was already in. Right. Robert Smalls had been commissioned in the army. He was fighting. Yeah. There were other people fighting in the army. I don't think you needed to have the Emancipation Proclamation in, in order to uh, well, bring fact, blacks into yeah. the war. No, you didn't, but it helped a lot once you had the proclamation to give it legal authority. In fact, That's true, but it would seem to me that uh, if, you know, all of these people escaping, uh, yeah. the robber smalls of the world, Right. Bringing them in to encourage them right. to, uh, to, right. to, to come or to even to assist them right. in the coming and enlisting in, in the war. I mean, you could have had thousands, yeah. hundreds of thousands of blacks coming into the war with right. some assistance if that's all you wanted was them to fight the war. Right. You, yeah. you didn't have to have the Emancipation Proclamation to do that. Yeah. But aren't there generals who don't really want African-American oh, fighters? I'm sorry, so the, 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 Some of the officers who really didn't want African-Americans oh, uh, to fight. So this every sort Democrat, of pushed them. Every, right. Right. every Democratic <laughs> party member who was a general, mm -hmm. for sure. In fact, well, what the proclamation finally does, because it's an executive order by the commander-in-chief, is it means now, legally and before the world, every advance of Union armies and the Union Navy is a liberating advance, whether the officers like it or not. The proclamation is actually an order to Union officers as much as it's a statement to the world. Mm -hmm. uh, this war will now free the slaves in the states in rebellion. And of course, I mean, even Lincoln understood that Eventually, if you win the war, it means the slaves are going to be freed in Kentucky and Maryland and Missouri uh, as well, and Delaware as well, the border states. But it gives a legal authority now. I'll give you one quick example. I did a little book of two slave narratives that were recently discovered about 10, 12 years ago, written after the war by two men who had been black soldiers. Well, excuse me, they weren't soldiers, actually. They were freed during the war. And one of them, John Washington, was freed along the Rappahannock River in April of 1862. So it's well before the proclamation. And in his narrative, he remembers the two, he gets across the Rappahannock, he's met by a, a contingent of a New York regiment, and he remembers two officers saying to one another, 
do we have the authority to free this guy? Hmm. And he said, one said to the other, well, I don't know, but they just freed the slaves in the District of Columbia two days ago, which is how I was able to date the day he became free, because D.C. emancipation was April 16th. This guy was freed on April 18th. Technically, those officers had no authority to free him. But this is the process that's already begun. Congress ended slavery in the district with compensation. Mm -hmm. Emancipation comes by a crooked road. It's no, a sure. very Absolutely. crooked road. By the time Lincoln signs that proclamation, a lot has happened, including the first major black regiment, the first South Carolina volunteer. 54th mm -hmm. Regiment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, no, no, no. The first South Carolina that was formed. South Carolina before the 54th. Yeah. Uh, well, they were from South formed Carolina, in the Sea Islands. It took. It took on the Massachusetts name because of Robert Gould Shaw right. for being from Massachusetts, but those were South Carolinians in the 54th Regiment. Yeah. I mean, it may not have been a South Carolina regiment. Yeah. The name was just Massachusetts, but they were from yeah. South Carolina. Yeah. Okay, I want to... I wanna... I'm proud of some things about South Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot to be proud about in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I am a little... Look, I, I, you know, um, I, I, I'm learning a whole lot here today. I'm going to have to go back and uh, we just start. stop reading budgets <laughs> and start reading history again. Uh, well, okay, here's another thing. And Edna, you can start and everybody can, can jump in. Um, you mentioned that this was hugely controversial. No guarantee that this is going to work. No guarantee that... Vast numbers of Union soldiers are going to throw down their guns and say, I'm not in this war anymore. And that did happen. Oh, yes. Not on a huge scale, but it happened. And then there's the resistance from the Confederacy. Yes. <laughs> which includes now edicts about re-enslavement and edicts about uh, execution mm -hmm. uh, for black soldiers if captured and so forth. The Emancipation Proclamation, correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm radicalized this war absolutely, and made it, if anything, far more bloody and for stakes far higher. Absolutely. And no one knew that as well as the Confederates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, I mean, the, the point is the Confederacy feared that idea of yeah. a black rebellion yeah. to begin with. Yeah. And so now you have the president saying all of these people are freed yeah. and they have the, the right to protect themselves, abstain from violence, but do what you have to to protect yourself. Right. And then you're recruiting these men into the military. Yeah. That's the biggest rebellion ever. I right. mean, you know, right. they're doing it legally, yeah. at least under the, the authority of the, the, uh, the nation, under the union. But this is the rebellion that the Confederates were so afraid of. Yeah. And so you have the Fort Pillow incident, for instance. These yeah. people aren't even allowed to, the, these men, it's a, it's a fort where there's 600 men, and <coughs> many of them, most of them, I assume, are, are black troops. And when they try to surrender, they are supposedly shot down. Mm -hmm. And so it's the Confederacy deciding, we're not going to have this. We're, not, we're, going, to, we're going to shoot black men yeah. who are in the Union uniform, or we're going to sell them into slavery. Yeah. And they're not distinguishing between people who were freeborn mm -hmm. and people who were runaways from slavery or had been liberated by the Union Army. They don't care. They're all the same. In the minds of diehard committed Confederates, an Emancipation Proclamation like this was a recipe for slave insurrection. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, a recipe for slaves to kill their masters. Right, right. And, uh, and they did. And they here did. and there, they did. And they had uh, guns. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. But, but also, it, 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 it has... It has foreign and diplomatic and international implications, and Lincoln and many, many others are perfectly aware of this. Say a word about that, or we should say a word about that. This proclamation is also aimed abroad. Absolutely. Uh, it's not just about stripping the Confederacy of this very strong labor force. Yeah. It's, or increasing the size of the Union Army, yeah. but it's also about making sure that the European powers don't enter the war on the side of the Confederacy. Because the people of Europe, not so much their leaders and businessmen, but, but the average citizen of England and France had already decided 
that they wanted a free labor system. Yeah. And so when Lincoln decided to tie this war to mm -hmm. emancipation, mm -hmm. to black freedom, then it was obvious, at least from the perspective of the common man in Europe, yeah. that they would want to side with the Union or would want to stay neutral. Yeah. They would not want to join the Confederacy. There's a tremendous debate, especially in Britain, uh, yeah. about yeah. emancipation in America. I mean, arguably, other than World War II, the Brits have never been so interested in what's going on in the United States <laughs> right. as mm -hmm. they were in 1863, 64, and Indeed. 65. Because it had such implications mm -hmm. for their own class system, yes. their own, and cotton. Mm -hmm. oh, we could go on about that all night. May I get the two of you, though, to, to, to say something about why is this document sacred? Why do people line up? Why, why do you think people need to see I mean, people need to see the Declaration of Independence. It's so famous. The Constitution is our Constitution. But what is it about this document, whatever it actually says, that makes people line up for blocks? So, you know, it is the, you know, to form a more perfect union. It's our aspiration. And like the Declaration of Independence, it is something that reminds us when we stray from our better angels, to quote Lincoln, that there is a place that we can come back to, that there is something that really is our core values. Even if we don't live up to those core values much of the time. Mm -hmm. With the showing tonight, I'm not sure how many of you were able to see it or who came during President's Weekend, there were lines around the building. On the 150th anniversary, it was just incredible. It was so cold outside and there were people who were lined up for three, you know, lines up for three days. People weren't in line for three days, but there were three days <laughs> worth, of, worth of lines. And we did something very special um, and had a midnight ceremony uh, on December 31st, 2013, January 1st, 2014, um, to, um, or to, I'm sorry, 2012 tw uh, and 2013, um, and had a ceremony in the rotunda with singers, with um, speeches, and people were there. Congress was in session. Um, at that point, Nancy Pelosi was Speaker of the House. She brought 15 or 20 members of Congress to, to come for that very special moment. But it was really electric, and it was, you know, people who are, the, you know, the children of the formerly enslaved and the children of former slave owners and people who were neither and who were recent immigrants, all feeling that it was America at its best, America reaching for its highest aspirations. And I think that's the, that document and many of the documents that are here uh, in the National Archives are the things that make us realize who we can be when we are being our best selves. I can't do any better than that. Oh. <laughs> you sure? I'm a good enough politician <laughs> not to uh -huh. try to improve upon that. Uh -huh. Right, Governor? <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's, and we that's so need though. to. We so sure. need to be. Re I mean, every day we need to be reminded um, of of who we can be, of what the, the greatness of the nation and what those original documents <laughs> said about that. We're going to go to Q and A here in a minute, but you, could, since you did that on watch night, mm -hmm. the twelfth to the, or the two thousand twelve to 13, thirteen, right, one hundred and fiftieth anniversary. Uh, you can find this in many books, uh, many places, but uh, that night was celebrated, the original was celebrated that night all over the land, south, north, in between. Uh, Frederick Douglass was in Tremont Temple in Boston that all day, actually. Huge. If, you ever, if you've ever seen Tremont Temple, which is now a Baptist church, it can fit about 3,000 people. And they... Uh, those of you who know this story, uh, my apologies. But they, had, they had a festive watch day all day long. They were singing. They were, you know, speeches now and then. And, and then they were waiting to get the news by the telegraph. Uh, they had runners going to the telegraph office down uh, Tremont Street in Boston. This was sort of abolitionist Boston, getting ready for the moment. Actually, there were two such gatherings in Boston. The more kind of uppity-up abolitionists <laughs> were at the Academy of Music, but anyway, <laughs> this was the black crowd in Tremont Temple <laughs> with some white friends. Um, and, but, then, but the news wasn't coming. 
as you may know, it just wasn't coming. It was 5 o'clock and 6 o'clock and 7 and 8 p.m. and it wasn't coming and it wasn't coming. And suddenly all those fears, all those anxieties about, oh my God, he might not sign mm -hmm. it. There's going to be some new compromise. Congress got too involved. <laughs> yeah, and messed up a good executive order. Um, uh, and then finally, at something like 9.15, the runner comes in. But it goes to your point. The runner comes in and has the actual text and starts to try to read it. But, I mean, if you've actually read it, it it's not made for oratory. Yeah. It's meant for a courtroom, actually. And... They just drowned him out. They didn't care what it actually said. And Douglas, with an old black preacher whose name was Rue, that's the only way I, he identifies him, led the throng in singing old spirituals. They sang, you know, uh, blow, uh, blow the trumpet. Uh, uh, what's it? Gabriel. Gabriel. Blow ye the trumpet. And many other songs. And they just partied. I mean, they, they danced. They jumped up and down. They cheered. They hugged. They cried. And they were thrown out of the building at midnight because they only had it rented till then. And they regathered at a black church in Beacon mm -hmm. Hill. And they, in, a, in Douglas's words, essentially partied all night. And he walked out the next day in a little fluffy snowfall and took the train back to Rochester. But just before he left Rochester to come to Boston for this celebration, he showed that he had confidence that this was going to happen because he wrote on the 28th of December an editorial for his newspaper to be printed the first week of January <laughs> entitled A Day for Poetry and Song. Mm -hmm. Didn't matter what the text said. Mm -hmm. Only in the states in rebellion. It's a military necessity. Huh? Mm -hmm. you know, we can pick this document apart forever and Lincoln doesn't come out always so pretty, but he comes out sounding like a lawyer which is what he was. Um, but they wanted a day for poetry and song. And that may be what still people need. Mm -hmm. yeah. They need to know this thing happened. Well, you know, when we, when we displayed the, um, the emancipation, there, there was a little bit of, you know, some blog pieces and some op-ed pieces are like, well, it's not really that big a deal. Who mm -hmm. cares? Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't really mean that much. You know, why are we celebrating this? It's an old problem. Yeah, you know, but it is, it is something that gets to the heart of the still, the part of America that was not yet free. Huh. But it, and also the agency that the enslaved people had in pushing for their freedom and the yeah. role that Frederick Douglass played and yeah. that others played. It wasn't just... Lincoln freeing the slaves, right. it was what the enslaved people were pushing for yeah. on their own. Why does that idea persist? I, you and I have talked about yeah. this before. <laughs> that idea that, well, the proclamation didn't mean that much. Where does that come from? Why does it persist? Well, I think, what do people mean when they say that? Well, in part... <laughs> Not I, that you can speak for everybody. Right. Yeah, but, but I think, and, and especially now, that's true. Uh -huh. Uh, especially after Lerone Bennett's book, I think right. that, that yeah, yeah. definitely put a damper on things. Yes. But I think... And the 60s did. Yes, generally. Ab absolutely. <laughs> because even after, well, well, by 76, by 1876, when Douglas is doing his oration yeah. at the Freedmen's yeah. um, Memorial to, right. or monument to Lincoln, he's talking about the fact that well, he's feeling that emancipation has not become what he hoped it would be. Oh, yeah. And so from that time, even down to the present, I think there is dissatisfaction that the promise right. was not realized. Right. But people had different ideas about what the proclamation was all about. Sure. So Lincoln thought, at least initially, yeah. that it was about severing the bonds of slavery. Right. African Americans always saw it as equality. Exactly. And so you've but got. But it doesn't say that. anything about rights. No, at no, all. nothing yeah. at all. Yeah. But it is the starting point yeah, yeah. for those rights. Yeah, yeah. So without the Emancipation Proclamation, yeah. there would have been no Thirteenth Amendment. Right. There would have been no Fourteenth and Fifteenth Amendment. Right. Right. There would have been <coughs> the Civil Rights Movement takes off from the Emancipation Proclamation. Right. You know, and leaders from the time the proclamation was issued until today, right. still go back to Lincoln and the proclamation and the possibilities that opened up as a consequence. The first paragraph of King's I Have a Dream speech, 
is all about the 100th anniversary of emancipation. Mm -hmm. we, 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 we always remember the last three minutes of that speech. That's where the dream, the peroration about the dream, mm -hmm. is only the last three minutes. Right. It's really, I've always called that speech, and nobody will ever adopt this, but <laughs> I've always called it the greatest Civil War commemoration speech ever given. <laughs> Uh, they're the greatest emancipation and commemoration speech ever, but that doesn't come off the tongue like the dream speech. Uh, but that's where King begins. That's how he lays out the whole metaphor of why are we here. And four times he uses the refrain, and the Negro is not free. Mm -hmm. that's right. Four times. Uh, 100 years. It says 100 years later, the Negro is not free. So without that document. Mm -hmm. Have you ever gotten out just section one of the 14th Amendment? I mean, you can't just take it out of the, I mean, <laughs> actually, you'd have to take the whole 14th, all five sections. But I think the section one of the 14th Amendment should rise to that same sacred quality. I mean, it, for some people it has, but, um, but, you know, Americans don't line up for blocks and blocks right. and blocks. Gee, let's go see the 14th Amendment, <laughs> Mom. You know, I don't think we do that. Uh, but without emancipation, no 13th, no 14th, no 15th, and without the 14th Amendment, I, this society would probably fly apart. Um, yeah. We're in the National Archives. Nobody needs to explain to anybody what the 14th Amendment is, right? <laughs> no, we don't need to. We're going to have Q&A now, and uh, we're going to ask you to go to the microphones uh, uh, because this is being recorded, and uh, direct your questions or comments to whomever you wish. Yes, sir. Last week, uh, a day in history in the newspaper on the Metro, March 13th, 1865, Confederates p pass a law saying that if you, as a, a black uh, African American, serve in the service, you will receive your freedom. <clears throat> I'm seeing that that is not correct. Those terms are wrong. I don't know what <coughs> I'm seeing on YouTube. Who knows what, or not YouTube, uh, the the internet, it's saying there are clauses and some document that was passed that says, per the terms of your owner, per the terms of the state. Yeah. Can you, someone please tell me what document that is and what the interpretation of how that would work for the people that passed that for that, that law for uh, government in the Confederate part of the, the, the country? I'm very glad you asked that and, and Edna helped me here, but the Confederates too came to the point where they decided they were going to have to emancipate some slaves in order to get their military service. This first began with a Confederate general named Patrick Claiborne. As early as December 1863, he was an Irish-born Confederate. And his argument was, emancipation is going to happen in this war. We should control it. And over the course of 1864, the Confederate leadership, military and civilian, and in the, in the Southern press, I, I never understood this until Bruce Levine's book. There's a truly t excellent book on this by a historian named Bruce Levine called Confederate Emancipation. He showed that this was a rich debate all over the Southern press in 1864. Should they free some male slaves to get them into the army? And what if they could get 100,000 slave soldiers? Slaves have been used as soldiers throughout history, since antiquity. Now, the debate is more than rich. It's embittered. Hundreds of people writing in and saying, are you crazy? The whole meaning of this war is lost if we do this. The point of this war was to preserve slavery. But eventually, Jefferson Davis himself and Robert E. Lee, by early 65, mm -hmm. in the very last desperate <laughs> two, three months of the war, warmed up to this policy. And that document that I said, well, I don't know the source here, of, but that document was the Confederate Congress authorizing the recruiting of some slave males into the Confederate Army. Uh, their owners, I think, had to be compensated. Yes, yes, exactly. And they were to be promised their freedom. <laughs> right. Yes. Now, that, there was a unit or two, I don't know, 100 people or something. No one knows for sure how many actually drilled in Richmond for a week or so. 50. 50 people. It's 50. There you go. There, you learned it here. 50. Good. Um, but yeah, I mean, and what Bruce Levine has shown us in his book, and I'll be very simple on that, 
He said, look, this was the Confederacy trying to control Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because for those who believed in it, it was their attempt to say, oh, oh okay, if this war is going to destroy slavery, at least most parts of it, we're going to control race relations when this is over, mm -hmm. which would have meant peasantry, no rights, no liberties, no anything. It's a, it's a fascinating underside story of the Civil War that we really didn't know that much about until recently, although it was always there in the record. What impressed me in the Levine book was the press record of this. The Southern, white Southerners really debated this, uh, and they were tortured in this debate. It, it's just so reeking with irony to, to read their debate over this. Uh, so that document, that piece probably was accurate. That is accurate. Mm -hmm. Think so? Absolutely. Okay, 50. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go over here next. How you doing, Doc? Good to see you again. Good to see you. Uh, I'm Captain Robert uh, Hemingway. I'm a native of Georgetown, South Carolina. So how you doing, sir? <laughs> um, a name like Hemingway, I was a guesser. I know, right? <laughs> For the rest of the audience, we're all over that place. <laughs> but um, the parts of this document that mention indentiture and that mention and servile insurrection. So my question is, is was there some mention uh, uh, Outside of being black, there were some people who were very oppressed in the South. I, some, and I wonder how that applies. And second, was there really any servile insurrection when this knowledge document got out? Were there slave uprisings on these plantations and that kind of thing? Well, there were people who were arrested who were found carrying the Emancipation Proclamation. So, you know, if you were in the Confederacy, you could not be seen with that document. Mm -hmm. And so some people were charged with attempting to uh, start an insurrection. But the real insurrection comes when these men join the Union Army or Navy. You know, it's, it's the way the South is looking at it. So to that extent, yes, it does occur. And there are um, instances even before the proclamation is issued uh, where it looks like in Adams County, Mississippi, I believe, there was some indication that there, there, there was an attempted insurrection there uh, before the proclamation. But that was uh, quieted very quickly. The guys were, the men supposedly involved were rounded up and executed uh, because they didn't want it to get out that there was that possibility that black men would rise up. It's very interesting you use the word indenture. I don't, the word's very not in the proclamation, but you, your, implica your implication is interesting. I mean, did, did the Emancipation Procl Proclamation imply you know, poor white people, or, or is that what the word? Yeah, I see. It yeah. says those per persons held to service or something along those lines? Not in the proclamation. Yeah, servitude. Um, servitude. Well, but the Freedmen's Bureau, yeah. which was created two years <laughs> later, was created to feed freed people and indigent mm -hmm. others and white people to, f to feed the poor uh, refugee people of the South. So it's, uh, this war forced the government to do things it had never done before, including feed starving people, whether they were white or black. Right. Um, and the, the language of uh, people held to labor would uh, have yes. been found in the Constitution. Okay. Because they don't ever mention the word slave or slavery. They just yeah. say mm -hmm. others or people held to labor. So it's a euphemism. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, sir. Professor, I, I, I'm not an academic, but I am a stickler for uh, correct quotes. And it must be emphasized that when you talk about King's I Have a Dream speech, yes. he has a word that you didn't mention. It still is not free. So oh, we have to underline the still. I, I mean, he corrected. did that rhetorically with such power. <laughs> secondly, I think... quite that, right. Yes. I think, secondly, Congressman, I don't come from South Carolina, but in Connecticut, on, on December Yo, 31st... No, going to the movie, but go ahead. On December 31st, <laughs> we were in church, and we were in church primarily because we called that watch night. Yeah. We were watching for the freedom that was coming. So, you know... It, it was 155 years ago, but the power of the memory of the, that sure. whole thing is, is still a continuum. Uh, Dr. Uh, Medford, I really have to express my appreciation for your keen insights in terms of this whole development. 
But there's something that I think needs to be lifted, and that is Frederick Douglass wasn't the only black person knocking at the door. I mean, Daniel Alexander Payne says in his re recollections, you know, he talks about his going to the White House and Henry Harlan Garnett. I mean, the brothers were down there because they didn't allow sisters at that time. Oh, the <laughs> sisters were there too. Okay, I don't know they about that. They were there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Wakanda. Wakanda. <laughs> and Harriet, ja Harriet Jacobs was working at the contraband camp in Arlington. Just, I'd throw that in. But I, I think that your point is so poignant when you get to the conclusion of the Emancipation Proclamation. It is powerful because it is one time that the government declares a political perspective that is ethical. That's why I think that you see the word God at the conclusion of that, that document. That's why you see you know, the, the, the possibilities Lincoln was on to something. I don't know whether he was responsible for it or whether it was one of the black guys he was talking to, but you know, he was certainly being perceptive. I'd like for you to just talk about you know, some of the other black people and what they were doing and how they exercised that kind of influence. You're absolutely right. Um, we, we do have a tendency to concentrate on Douglas because he was so, so dynamic, okay? But there were other people. There were other black abolitionists. So you had the Purvises. You would have had uh, John Mercer Langston. Uh, you would have had Henry Highland Garnett, who was a real firebrand. Uh, you would have had, um, who, oh, Crummel, Crummel absolutely. Uh, no? Crummel was in Africa during the it's, war, but, but it, that's all right. Was he? Okay. He came back after the war. Okay. Right. So you mean people during the war who, okay, okay, all right. And in terms of women, you would have had someone like a Charlotte Fortin who went south to teach uh, these people who had been liberated uh, along the coastal areas of South Carolina. You have to and, forgive me because black people are missing from history as well women, so I didn't know that. <laughs> And if you actually look at the many volumes of the documentary history of emancipation, which are all done from documents in this building, yes. way down deep in this building, the greatest documentary project maybe ever, so many of those documents were written by black women. Uh, just open a volume. Uh, or, or, or pick up the one volume uh, called uh, Forever Free, which is mm -hmm. like the greatest mm -hmm. hits of the seven volumes. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> amazing documents by women whose husbands were off at the front, who yes. lost their brother, who are demanding equal pay mm -hmm. from the government. And they write, right. <laughs> they write to, President, Dear President of the United States or the government. You know, I mean, right. just, they don't care. They just, they, they, but it also shows how the war brought this awareness of government. You use the word government. That governments can actually do something ethical. Yeah, maybe that's why it's so sacred. You've got, you've got black women who's serving as spies. You know, you've got Mary Elizabeth Bowser in the Jefferson Davis White House in Richmond. You know, you've got, so women are absolutely present there. They may not have the influence that men did, but they were there. And they, and they were. Harriet Tubman, why, why, why are we mentioning her name? Well, because everybody knows about her, and we know her. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm and not we, too sure and, everybody and knows about her escapades. I mean, you know, people know the name, but uh, I mean, I thought she was critical to, to this whole effort. In your state? In my yes. state, yes. the Cumbahee River. I mean, her, her right. best, to me, most effective work was up and down the Cumbahee River. Um, I just think that I don't think Frederick Douglass would have been what he was without her. So, to me, she's she's number one. <laughs> Frederick Douglass may be number two. <laughs> <laughs> I have a new biography coming out in October of Douglass, but I will not dispute that. <laughs> not now, <laughs> sir. Uh, <clears throat> first, just a, a quick observation. I think the reason for the lines. Uh, on, on January 1 of, of uh, 
2013 is that in the public mind the, the historians might think that the 13th amendment freed the slaves the uh, lawyers might think that the 13th amendment freed the slaves I think and to the, the public believes that the emancipation freed the, the proclamation freed the slaves I think they're right but I think that's what explains its its enduring appeal but just two quick uh, so technical questions. One, the the, uh, the the proclamation itself, unlike the preliminary proclamation, does not refer to forever free. Uh, no, it so, doesn't. It's a, yeah. So one qu first question is is uh, uh, does that have any significance? And the second one, my birthday is June nineteenth, which I think is Juneteenth. Yeah. And I could never figure out, and that apparently has uh, some significance as a, a day of freedom, but I've never been able to figure out why. And if, if, if in fact, it is Juneteenth, if you could answer that question for me. So two technical so I, Juneteenth. Well, Juneteenth is just, it really was a Texas holiday. Right. Yes. It was not, I mean, everybody celebrated, but June 19th, 1864 is when the, uh, the slaves in Texas found out they were free. Uh, so it was 18 months. They stayed in slavery 18 months not knowing that they were free. So June 19th, 1864 became Juneteenth. Thank you. That's why we celebrate. Right. Why they celebrate. And the question of... Uh, the, 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 the omission of forever free, is there any? Well, uh, it's actually in the final proclamation, but it's well, where it Lincoln is quoting it from the preliminary emancipation. So he did include it. He quotes himself <laughs> at the beginning. Uh, that's audacity, isn't it? <laughs> uh, but the language in the final proclamation is thenceforward shall be free. Right. That's a change. The thenceforward is there, but it's from... The September 20th. So no, no significance? No, not that, that there's a change. I see. Thank but you. actually, he enhances it, you could say. He kind of does it twice in the final. <laughs> right. OK. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, I had a question. I just wanted to make a statement about um, I was over at Lincoln Co Lincoln's Cottage um, uh -huh. this past week, and there was an author on Stanton. And um, as, as an example of Lincoln's Really, actually, his strong anti-slavery sentiment was that when when Stanton got when before Stanton became Secretary of the War, before he was appointed, he wasn't an abolitionist. He was he was a Democrat. He right. he really didn't. He never really spoken out that much against slavery. And then after he was appointed uh, Secretary of War. Um, Lincoln just basically turned him 180 degrees around. Mm. And um, so I thought that was, I just wanted to make that comment. And Stanton gave Lincoln credit for doing that? Is that, is that well, what? Well, it, it just happened. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing because he spent a lot of time with Lincoln, I'm, sure. I'm, I'm guessing it was because of Lincoln sure. that he turned 180 degrees around. Uh, also, I have a question. Um, when um, Lincoln formed his cabinet and when he had, um, before the, Right before the war really broke out, when Seward was negotiating with the Southern leaders as to to hopefully prevent the war, was was Lincoln um, perhaps telling the Southern leaders that I'm going to create this national currency, and um, you know we're going to compensate you big time <laughs> with this uh, national. I mean, he he was. Uh, um, mm -hmm. Chase had been the Secretary of Treasury, and he created the national currency. And and um, of of uh, and I was wondering, could that have actually been in the works during the hopefully negotiated peace before the war broke out? Could Seward had actually could could Lincoln and Chase and Seward had talked amongst themselves and said. Tell them that we're going to create this national currency and we're going to stabilize the economy and we're going to pay them whatever they need, you know, just to prevent this war, because war is always more expensive than 
you know, than compensation is. So I was just curious if you'd, if you'd studied that, if you know anything about that. Well, there were many compromise measures considered in the winter of 1861, from <laughs> February into March, many compromise measures, including the old measures of a Missouri Compromise Line and all mm -hmm. sorts of... Um, there was some talk of renewing <laughs> or revisiting the, uh, the question of fugitive slaves. Um, uh, I don't know of any compromise measure. There, it, it may have been discussed about currency. I mean, the, the, the brilliant recreation of the U.S. currency came during the war as a means of financing the war. In fact, one of the greatest triumphs of the Lincoln administration was its ability to finance this war. The, the United States government had never done anything this expensive. Um, I mean, it was costing by 1864, I forget the total number now, four or five million dollars a week to fight the war. The federal government never even had budgets like this. But I don't know of any, if somebody does, please speak up, evidence that they were promising a new currency and because the new currency would provide compensation. Now, there were a lot of compromise measures considered. None of them worked. Um, none of them worked because, in effect, Lincoln, at least privately, he said nothing publicly during the secession winter. But privately, he had said, no, we draw the line on slavery's expansion. Slavery will not have a future in any new part of the United States. And that was non-negotiable for the South, or parts of the South. Yes, ma'am. Hi. My name is Janice Parker Watson. I'm from uh, South Georgia, and I just feel very connected to the subject. Uh, first of all, my, my birthday is September 22nd. So, but my father's grandfather was actually a slave, and uh, the story is told he was 16 when the emancipation um, uh, uh, was proclaimed, and he had run away and was hiding out, and it took some convincing for him to uh, really come out of hiding and accept that, uh, that he was free. Uh, my grandfather was not born until 1892, but then he was named Freeman, or Free Man Parker. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, by 1963, I was, I was 12 when Martin Luther King, you know, the, uh, the dream uh, speech. And it occurred to me recently, I was the same age as the youngest girl who was killed in Birmingham. And had she lived, um, Denise McNair, we would be the same age now. So at the... Um, 50th anniversary of the March on Washington, I held up a sign that said, I am Denise McNair. Mm -hmm. So, just my thoughts. Thank you. Well, I could just add to that, that I don't remember where I first read this, but about one third of all Americans, which means more than 100 million of us, can trace our families directly to someone in the Civil War. One third of this, in this vast nation of immigrants from everywhere now, still one third of us can trace our people directly. So this is a family story. It, it always will be. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Jim Bognet. Thank you all for this delightful panel. It was really great. Uh, Professor Blight, I listened to your class um, on Yale Open uh, Government about uh, Civil War and Reconstruction. It's awesome. And the source material, the Confederate war widows and whatnot, really enlightening. My question is on the Emancipation Proclamation as a piece of political and policy uh, proposal. Did I don't think Lincoln campaigned on it. I remember him saying, if I could not free the slaves and keep the Union, I'll do that. Mm -hmm. Where did it spring from? Was it something that he was germinating on as a nuclear weapon to bring out at the right time? Was it something that Stanton or Frank Blair brought to him and they had arguments over? Where did it come from as a policy proposal? Did it come from Lincoln or did it come from his staff or the African-American people who were coming to him and beseeching him? 
Well, you know, he had a lot of, of uh, people trying to get him to emancipate from the very beginning, actually. But he always resisted because he did see this war as one to reunite the Union initially. But when he realized that even if they were able to win the war, slavery would still be an issue. So it was about what was going to happen the next time. And so he took that into consideration as well. So by the summer of 1862, he had already, he had decided that he was the one who was going to have to do this. Um, generals in the field had attempted to do it and he had said, no, you can't do this. If it's, if it's going to be done this way, I'm the person who's going to have to do it. And he, so he does decide to do it. It's not coming from his cabinet because he's reading, he's telling, he's sharing this decision with them after he's made the decision. And he's not asking for their approval. He's just telling them that this is what's going to happen. And some of them are startled that he's gotten to that point. Others are pleased but are concerned that the nation is going to see this as, as a panicky union. You know? So they're saying, uh, it, it is Seward who says, wait until there is a union victory. And it took a while for them to get to that. And it wasn't until Antietam in September, uh, September 17th, 1862, that they got that victory, slim as it was. It was enough for him to issue the preliminary proclamation. But this is something that he comes up with without, I mean, he's hearing what people are saying, why he should be doing this. But the decision is really his in the end. I'd just add to that, well, first of all, it would never come from Frank Blair. <laughs> the Blairs weren't <laughs> into this at all. Uh, but he's also affected by, and this goes to the question of whether a Douglas or, or anyone else in black leadership could have affected Lincoln. He's clearly affected by the fact that droves of slaves are escaping to Union lines. This is happening from the beginning of the war. It ha it's happening everywhere in, in late 61 and into 62. Uh, what do you do with them? What's their status? Who are they? What do you call them? What, what, what is an escaped slave within Union lines? Well, do you tur turn them back to their owners? Well, they tried that. Uh, it was called denial of asylum in military language. It did not work. How were you to find the loyal owner of a slave and then, or a disloyal owner of a slave? You couldn't do that. Um, but the sheer pressure, this is where the argument about how the slaves freed themselves, in some cases, comes from, that the sheer number of slaves escaping into Union lines by 1862, and especially as the war expands. Everywhere the war goes in the South, if the slave population is dense at all, there are hundreds and then thousands of slaves escaping. So you've got to have a policy now to contend with that. And that policy evolves out of that reality. And part of that reality becomes these things called contraband camps, of which there were, I don't know, 25 or more official such camps run by the War Department all around the rim of the South, beginning in 62 in informal ways and formal ways in 63. And here's what we know about numbers. And by the way, emancipation is something we should, be, should celebrate and be joyful about. But lots of people died in the process of becoming free. The casualty rates in some of those contraband camps, these are the refugee camps to which many freed people managed to get to. Cairo, Mississippi, Arlington out here had a huge one. Uh, um, no, Cairo, Illinois, um, oh, I'm forgetting Corinth. the name. Corinth, Mississippi. Corinth, Mississippi, thank you. Had one of the biggest ones. But these became disease centers, just like army camps were. Mm -hmm. And there, there are new books being done. Now. There's a good one out now by Sean Romanning on these mm -hmm. contraband camps. We used to think the records about the contraband camps were never going to be big enough to write these, but they are. Mm -hmm. Armies keep records. Boy, do they ever. They're all in this building. Um, but w there's, there's one study that says about one of every four freed people who made it to a contraband camp died in the process. So emancipation is not pretty uh, at all. But people still came. People still moved. Um, so the pressure of that is forcing this policy as well. Um, and you've got union officers writing to their, to their superiors saying, uh, what do I do? I got 50. I got 100 former uh, slaves here. Who are they? What are they? What do I do with them? You know. Um, 
It's push and pull from all directions that brings emancipation. The war emancipates slaves, Lincoln emancipated slaves, and the slaves emancipated themselves all at once. Oh, here next. We'll take one more, I think. I, they're telling me in my ear to take one more. One yes, more, uh, okay. Yes, okay. yes, yes sir. Uh, Benjamin Roberts. And um, I'd like to read something. This is um, Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States. And he, in 1862, uh, there's an exchange of letters between Horace Greeley, the editor of the New York Tribune. He wrote a letter to Lincoln basically telling him to execute the confiscation laws. He was upset, and he was saying that Lincoln was equivocating all the time. And here is Lincoln's response to him. Dear sir, I have not meant to leave anyone in doubt. My paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union, and it is not either to save or destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could do it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. He did that in, with the border states and, and the, uh, the states in the north. What I do about slavery and the colored race, I do because it helps to save this union. And what I forbear, I forbear because I do not believe it would help to save the union. I have here stated my purpose according to my view of my official duty. And I intend no modification of my oft expressed personal wish that all men everywhere could be free. Yours, A. Lincoln. I contend that the slaves freed themselves. <laughs> the, ex the, the, the proclamation, Lincoln couldn't enforce the proclamation. In fact, it caused a lot of bloodshed afterward, especially one of the things that you don't hear anything about in, in, in history is um, Ebenezer Creek in Georgia, just outside Savannah. Um, Sherman's army was marching towards, towards the coast, and um, you had people following them all along the way from Atlanta because he had freed, he'd freed Atlanta. And there were thousands. Um, Captain Kerr, I think he, he was asked to look after these people, and he said there were at least 15,000. And Jefferson Davis, they were crossing Ebenezer Creek, and they put the pontoon bridges down. And, um, Jefferson Davis' army was being, being followed by Wheeler, by, by uh, General Wheeler, and they told the slaves, the people following them, to stay behind so if there's any contention up front, we would deal with them first. It was actually a trick, and it, I mean terrible, because they pulled up the pontoon bridges and left the slaves behind, and Wheeler's army just massacred those people, up to 15,000 people. And somebody mentioned Stanton. Uh, Lincoln sent Stanton down there to find out what was going on because it was bad press. Stanton ended up uh, speaking to, to Jefferson Davis and Sherman, and no, nobody paid the price for it. Actually, they got promoted. And Stanton said um, the, the, what, um, the explanation was fine. How do you have an explanation for 15,000 people dead and, and it is explained as fine? That's just my two cents. Thank you. You want to explain field order number 15? <laughs> <laughs> that would keep us here a lot longer that than would we have. But, but if, I, if I could say, uh, the, um, the, the, what you read was Greeley's, uh, Greeley sends um, yeah. uh, a letter to Lincoln called the Prayer of 20, Prayers of 20 Million. Right. Lincoln is responding to that. When Lincoln is responding with that whole thing about what I do, I do to preserve the Union, you're absolutely right. But Lincoln has already written the Emancipation Proclamation when he sends that letter to Greeley. So he's preparing the nation for what he's about to do. You have well, other people coming to him as well, mm -hmm. telling him he needs to do, you know, he needs to emancipate, and he's giving them the same thing. I will do whatever is necessary to save the Union when he's already written the proclamation. I don't think we give him enough credit for being a consummate politician. Absolutely. It's, he really was. And so he knew how to play the game. Uh, in terms of what's happening with the people uh, who, are, um, who do die when they pull up those pontoon boats, uh, what happens is he's talking, Stanton comes out and talks to Sherman. And he and Sherman get together with a group of 
black leaders mm -hmm. in the Savannah area. And that's where field, a special field order 15 comes from. That's when you get the 40 acres and a mule because they are taking that confiscated land and dividing it up and giving folk in that area possessory title to the land because Sherman really is tired of black people following his army, okay? <laughs> and so he gives them the land that he knows they will need to survive. But you're absolutely right, people die as a consequence of that. And no, no one's punished for that. There was no more racist general in the army than William Tecumseh Sherman. Mm. Uh, but even he had to free slaves. That's sometimes one of the great ironies of this mm -hmm. war. Anyway. All those people, the land was confiscated, but maybe one of them got their land back. N not every one of them, but most, most of them. them did. You're absolutely right, because of Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson, and the Congress gave it back to him in 1872, well, if my memory serves. But let me say this. Irrespective of whether or not the Emancipation Proclamation freed the slaves or they freed themselves, the fact of the matter is they never would have remained free without the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution. That's a fact. Because any executive order, for all intents and purposes, die with that president. And so the 13th Amendment had to be done, and Lincoln did it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Thank you. Such a pleasure to be on the show. Thank you, dear. Okay, thank you all for coming. Uh, that's it. There are lots of questions still out there, <laughs> but there always will be. Thank the you. The war is still being fought. <laughs> oh, yeah.